We're in Tarragona today. Is the twenty second yes. of May two thousand and eight. We're with Professor Itamar Evan Zohar from Tel Aviv University. Tal, Tel Aviv University. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, we're in Tarragona. And my first question is this: Most people in this part of the world say, "Ah, Evan Zohar, ah." Poly systems, and I know that you've done a lot of work since doing poly systems. Sure. Um, is it wrong to attach you to that term, and how can you bring us up to date in a few minutes? Mm. An easy question. <laughs> no, I'm joking, of course. Uh, well, it is not wrong to attach me to anything I've written. That's natural. Uh, what's disappointing about uh, being active in the field of academia is that one discovers your work sometimes 20 or 30 years uh, after you have published something. And, um, and um, sometimes, or more often than not, and in the case of uh, people's interest in policies and theory, uh, they don't really care for any work I've done after my uh, work on polycystic theory, and that also creates a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, for instance, uh, I've realized that many people uh, normally in translation studies quote one single paper where uh, uh, there is not even a discussion of polycystic theory, and uh, then they criticize it on the basis of that one single small paper they've, they've, they've read. And, um, um, well, what can I say? Uh, I cannot uh, respond to all criticisms that do not take into account the, uh, what I've been trying to do, because when I was initiating the work on polysystem theory, that was only, I considered it only initial steps towards something larger. And then I tried over the years to um, carry out particular concrete studies of very, a variety of cases that would either illustrate, exemplify, modify, enlarge, and uh, sometimes uh, nuance the, uh, the generalizations I put forward before as hypotheses. All this should have been taken by the community as just suggestions, not as dogmas for, uh, for an analyzing uh, various parameters, for instance, uh, uh, translation and translation contexts. Uh, so um, I'm, I, I cannot object to people attaching me to polysystem theory, but uh, I think that uh, what people miss is the fact that what I wanted to do was to draw people's attention to the necessity to study culture, heterogeneity in culture. So nowadays, mm -hmm. nowadays, I'm not really happy, you know, with the term because uh, maybe it has also deterred many people, uh, sounding too technical. I would, but you I would, would then be claimed to be doing within polysystem as a concept what lots of people in cultural studies would be doing today. Yes, in a way, but uh, people in cultural studies uh, are not really interested in that kind of dynamics uh, I was interested in, and, uh, and it, it will take us too long to explain the differences between Anglo-American cultural studies on the one hand and the uh, cultural research project uh, on the other. But, oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, what no. Is that well, just to, to, uh, to, with your permission to say something about your first question, um, it would be liberating, I think, if one stopped thinking or quoting polysystem and polysystem hypotheses and began thinking about heterogeneity on the one hand and complexity on the other. For instance, you've got various theories that emerged after my work on polysystem theory and, uh, and of course, naturally before that were 
uh, trying to deal with heterogeneity and complexity. Complexity theory, for instance, yes. I found terribly interesting. Yes. And uh, I believe can be very well combined with f some of the hypotheses I put forward before, but I don't see that kind of interest, you see. I don't see people trying to take... Not within literary studies. Not with literary yeah. studies, uh, cultural studies even less. In cultural studies, the, uh, you asked me now about cultural studies. Cultural studies, I see very little interest in heterogeneity as a factor in the um, maintenance and subsistence of groups. I can find much propaganda or much talk or much rhetoric about multiculturalism, okay. about the necessity to promote multiculturalism, but um, only based on ideological premises, not based on the necessity to investigate how societies have been able to exist over time with and in spite of, or more convincingly, with the help of contradictions and heterogeneity. And you then move into a more anthropological frame, mm. if you're talking about yes. factors like success, survival. Yes. Uh, anthropologists would not be pleased <laughs> if I said why, because I've not adopted anthropological methods, just borrowed anthropological ideas borrowed anthropological uh, strategies, but uh, on the whole, I would consider um, myself as someone who has been trying to, um, to learn a lot from a variety of disciplines, and uh, in concrete terms, uh, sociology on the one hand, anthropology, history, semiotics, and uh, I don't see I don't really see these disciplines as so distinct as people believe. I don't see the border as uh, stiff as people believe. Academics in universities and uh, they were created very m more often than not in order to justify borders and justify possessions, etc. But on the whole, I've seen in recent years, at least in recent, the recent, during the recent 20, 20 odd years, much transgression of borders. If you take scholars like Michelle Lamont from Harvard, she, what is she? Is she an anthropologist? Is she a sociologist? Is she um, a textual analyst? Is she a psychologist? Is she a cognitive student? She tries to combine all of the above, and I've also been trying to combine uh, many sources of knowledge. Uh, even when I was working on texts, and uh, I uh, very quickly realized that texts are not the real subject or the object of study. Texts are only manifestations of something that constrains them or constrain them, such as uh, at first we called it norms, then models, repertoires. People learn models, not texts. They they learn sets of rules, sets of combinations, rather than concrete um, concatenations uh, of uh, words. They learn possibilities of combinations, not combinations per se, even though they memorize combinations as well. Uh, but that's only part of the story. So I was interested in agents because when I was and trying to analyze literary struggles about which norms would prevail, Evidently, you are interested also in the people behind the struggle, but uh, uh, these were hidden in the shadow at that stage of my work. I wasn't really dedicating work to observing them, and you are absolutely right if you say that I've accumulated much more interest in the agents than just in the products of their work. And, but I've not become an anthropologist because I'm not, sitting, I'm not sitting the same way among people in a community pretending to be one of theirs, pretending to mingle with the crowd. And I hope, I, I all, almost believe that even anthropologists, anthropologists have already lost this kind of naive belief that they can be considered um, 
indigenous to indigenous people. <laughs> Some of them still do, you know. I want to go back to when you were 23, 24, when you were starting yes. your, your literary studies, surely, yeah. at that, that stage. How did you, what were you doing? And yes, you yes, well, uh, strange biography, because um, I never studied uh, literature in my, um, towards my first degree. Uh, and you know why? <laughs> I, I simply went to the university, entered some literature courses, listened to the uh, lectures by professors and decided this was not what I wanted to, <laughs> uh, to hear. I mean, the, they said s things I, as a young person, consider utterly stupid. So I thought uh, I might as well learn something I don't know anything about because I knew very much about literature. I, I was well read as a young person because we, uh, we were given many texts to read at school and uh, I grew up in a home where my father collected the library of some 6,000 volumes, all in Hebrew, by the way. So I read much of word literature. As the Hebrew saying is, I filled my stomach with many books. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, that wasn't what I was interested in when I went to those literary uh, lectures. So I, uh, I decided to learn something else, and I went to the Department of Philosophy. I never liked philosophy before, and I never liked philosophy after, <laughs> but <laughs> I think I, it was a very wise decision because it taught me a lot, among other things, uh, to be more critically, uh, to develop critical methods of thinking in a way, I mean, to be, to be simplistic about that. And then I also studied Semitic linguistics, that is, uh, some sort of archaic linguistics, you know, much before, even before structuralism, new grammarianism, new grammarianism, I think, that's the word, and um, mm, um, several Semitic languages, you know, like Ugaritic, Akkadian, Canaanite, uh, uh, Arabic, and so on. And that, that and Punic, <laughs> Punic, you know, the language written in Africa and, uh, and France, uh, uh, as far as Marseille where they found some 3,000 uh, inscriptions in Hebrew, Phoenician, Punic. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that, that was very helpful. But then I wanted to go to Jerusalem and study comparative literature. That was a new department, and I was dreaming about studying comparative literature. Even before I, I uh, began my studies at Tel Aviv, I went to England to study comparative literature, but uh, the British simply mocked at me, uh, saying that uh, there was no, no such a thing and uh, that the only literature that was worthwhile studying was English literature. And uh, that was the end of my um, honeymoon, honeymoon with the, uh, with the uh, English uh, universities. Anyway, for a short time I was staying in England. I don't remember how long, several months that is. And uh, I went to Jerusalem. They said, you can't possibly be admitted to studying comparative literature because you have no first degree background in literature. But the head of the department was a famous poetess, and I presented her with a list of translations I have done from various literatures, and that convinced her. So I was admitted uh, first as an extraordinary student, and very quickly they admitted me as a regular student to uh, comparative literature. And then, because I had done translation before and I was very attracted to the whole business of translation, and because I had my linguistic background, I proposed I write a PhD dissertation on translation, and that was not very well accepted, you know. The, uh, pros my prospective supervisor said, what are you? What are you? Are you a linguist? Are you a literary scholar? Are you a historian? Please define yourself. And I, Well, I'm sorry you can't put me in a <laughs> defined drawer. I, I'm interested in all of the above and, and much more. And eventually, 
uh, I received scholarships to go to, uh, to Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, and uh, in Denmark to university professors at the Department of Danish Literature allowed me to uh, present uh, a proposal for a PhD dissertation on inter-Scandinavian translations. You know, mm -hmm. that was quite funny. Here I came as a young person. I wasn't 23, but I was already 26 years old, I believe, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they never heard of the, they never were, have been interested in inter-Scandinavian translations, you know, translating between Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, because these people stupidly pretend to understand each other's languages, and they don't. The reality is that no Dane is capable of reading Swedish. No Swede is capable of reading Danish or Norwegian. The the, even the spelling alone is deterrent sufficiently. Hmm? There, I'm, I'm trying to make this short because if we go through this, it's going to be very long. I told you, I told you, you can cut off. Russian formalist, you yes. told me yesterday that you yes. discovered them in Copenhagen. Yes. 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 No, I did not discover in Copenhagen. I discovered Russian formalism through the lectures of my um, professor at, in Jerusalem at the said Department of Comparative Literature, but um, I, um, he, simply, um, he simply aroused my curiosity. He did not give a true account, as I now know, I can now say, I can now, I can now say so, uh, because I've become familiar with the case. And uh, in Copenhagen, when I was working on uh, on my dissertation, and uh, I was looking for some solid, uh, for some help, because uh, how, how shall I do the work, uh, with what concepts, what uh, methodology, what uh, I wanted to know, what people were thinking in the field, so I decided to, s to learn Russian not from scratch because I had decided to do it before but I never succeeded. You see, Russian is quite foreign from, for a Hebrew speaker and, uh, and you have to have quite a lot of patience in order to learn such a remote language. But I, I, uh, I developed some enormous interest in, uh, in reading the stuff and uh, I managed to teach myself Russian in Copenhagen and uh, began to read Russian formalists and among other things, uh, as you heard from me actually today, what came up to my mind, I discovered that the Russian formalists also uh, made a contribution to translation analysis and the role of translation in the making of a culture, a literature and a culture. So that that was incredibly helpful. I, when I eventually wrote my dissertation, not in Copenhagen, because I simply lost my financial uh, support for staying in Copenhagen, I had to go back home and wrote a dissertation in Tel Aviv under the supervision of my, my Jerusalem professor, um, who then founded the department in Tel Aviv. I, um, I made extensive use of what I have read in Copenhagen uh, by uh, Russian formalists and their followers because many people in Russia never consider themselves formalists or followers of Russian formalists because it was too dangerous for political reasons. Stalin simply uh, obliterated the work of, obliterated physically, I mean destroyed, destroyed books, destroyed records, you know, these people also were using new technologies to uh, collect data about literary activities, uh, such as poets reading their poetry aloud or folk, folk um, uh, narrators. No, the name is different in English. Uh, folk tellers? Folk, uh, yes. Uh, popular tellers, yes. uh, you know. Tellers of folk tales, I don't know. Yes. No, tellers, tellers of, 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 of tales, tellers of tales, yes, yes. Singer, Te not singer, but tellers of tales. Uh, they, they, they recorded them and the, 
and Stalin sent soldiers to destroy those those records. You know, and it's, it's Im unimaginable. So uh, many people who have had been students of uh, at the uh, institute created by the formalists, they continue their work without even mentioning the work of the Russian formalists, like the fellow I mentioned this morning, Fyodorov. But their work on translation studies, I can tell you without any hesitation, was far more advanced than the parallel work then conducted in the West. So I learned a lot from that. Very quickly, what should we be working on now? What problems should we be trying to solve? Well, we need a conference on that. I hope you organize one day or another such a conference because you touch a, a, a weak point. You really touch a sensitive point. I think we simply are not in the habit of thinking in these terms in the humanities, and that's one of our weaknesses because with my, our colleagues at the other departments, the departments of sciences or exact sciences or natural sciences, there is some agenda. This agenda can hold for five years or for ten years, and the agenda creates a global competition. Who will first analyze? So many people concentrate for a short span of time on a bundle of questions, and, and very quickly it turns out whether the bundle of questions uh, is useful or not, practical or not, can be developed, leads you anywhere or not. In the humanities, it may take 60 years before anyone realizes that this has been a deadlock, that certain proposals, for instance, take polycism uh, theory. Is it helpful? We don't know because there has been so little work being done in the framework of, uh, of, of contesting it, refuting, modifying, improving, uh, adding, or amplifying it, etc. Too little work because I don't consider work if someone simply copies certain hypotheses and tries to implement those hypotheses to one's materials. I consider work when someone says uh, we need more parameters or we need less parameters or this will lead us nowhere or we must combine ideas from from heterogeneity theory with complexity theory and creating new polysystem theory, etc. That would be that would be the work I was dreaming about. So we have got no agenda. We have got no agenda. Uh, and make no, no, not had, no. For example, that's one of the possibilities. My agenda, my personal agenda nowadays, is completely different. I mean, I take heterogeneity premises for granted now. I mean, I, I say this is the the ground for my work. I cannot look at any culture as a monotone sort of thing, as a homoge ho homogeneous culture. There is no, there are no homogeneous cultures. Even Aborigine culture in Australia is not homogeneous. I mean, you will find differences between different groups of people. Yes, but anthropologists, anthropologists like, uh, like uh, um, uh, Mary Douglas, the one, I think, who was interested in, in, the, in the Arapesh, yes, you remember the Arapesh tribe? She was terribly disappointed. She, was, she expressed tremendous disappointment with the fact that the Arapesh around the 70s adopted certain uh, cultural features from the whites. And she said, they are not, they are not really... Um, they, are, they betray their culture. You see, so that's, from my point of view, a complete miscomprehension, complete misunderstanding of how human societies m might work. I mean, do, to demand, to request, to require human societies to stick to their cultures unchangeably, that, that's, that's stupid, if not foolish. Anyway, um, I'm more interested in finding out the parameters of prosperity and uh, in doing so I have been able to to identify or to diagnose if you wish the group of people that are probably the agents of prosperity and my hypothesis has been in recent years that if this group of people does not exist 
or is not sufficiently developed in a society, that society simply cannot prosper. And I'm using, and I'm using the parameters uh, defined, for instance, by McNeil as the absence or, or presence of certain key features. And uh, that, that, that uh, has something to do with policy and theory, but only uh, if you take for granted as a dogma, as it were, or as a um, postulate for this kind of research that heterogeneity is, uh, is the regular um, character of, of a society rather than the other way around. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Professor Evans.